Hello and welcome. This is Christine Elder and welcome to my Batty About Bats presentation. Thank you so much for joining me. So the more you know about the subject you're drawing, the better. So we're gonna cover a little bit about their anatomy and their ecology and their behavior. And then we're going to go on to a sketching tutorial uh, where we draw a black bat together, particularly a flying fox, which is one of my favorite bats, one of the largest bats in the world that lives in Asia. So um, if you haven't already, you can get your uh, cheat sheet um, at the link below. So in case we haven't met, hi, I'm Christine Elder and I'm a uh, naturalist and uh, environmental educator and uh, biological illustrator. Uh, but my favorite thing to do is teach people how to draw and to use um, a nature sketching and journaling as part of a process to uh, understand nature in a deeper way and have more empathy for the natural world. And so uh, I primarily do focus on uh, being out in the field and doing nature sketching. So we won't be uh, doing any fine art today. Uh, we're not doing anything that we're gonna be framing and hanging on the wall. The idea is to learn enough about our subject to be able to appreciate it and uh, draw it more accurately, like I am here drawing a resplendent quetzal uh, in the rainforests of Costa Rica. And so why are we uh, focusing on bats today? Well, uh, you may uh, notice from my outfit that it's Halloween as I record this uh, tutorial. And so bats are, of course, uh, closely associated with Halloween. Um, and uh, I also like to educate people about the less well-loved, um, more um, misunderstood creatures. So not just the charismatic megafauna like giraffes and um, cute, uh, you know, zebras and such, but about, you know, the insects and creepy crawly things. And so lots of people have a fear of bats. So I hope you'll watch this and gain a little bit more appreciation for bats. Actually, also, thirdly, International Bat Week, and um, that's always the last week of October uh, in association with Halloween, and that's a, a week to uh, just recognize bats and their vital roles in the ecosystem and to appreciate them. So uh, bats serve a lot of roles, uh, one of one, which is uh, insect control. That's probably the one you are most familiar with when you see bats uh, leaving their roost and going out to hunt at night. Uh, and they can eat thousands of insects each night and they're important in controlling uh, crop pests for one. And so insect control is important uh, uh, ecological service they provide. Also pollination, like in this photograph, uh, we see a, a bat pollinating an agave plant. And so uh, they're important pollinators for lots of uh, plants, uh, especially in the tropics, and even some crops that you might be familiar with, like um, mangoes and cashews. <laughs> and um, and uh, thirdly, uh, they're important seed dispersers. So they not only eat uh, pollen and nectar, but they also eat uh, fruits. And then uh, once they eat that fruit and fly away uh, and defecate in a different part of the, um, their habitat, they have spread the, um, the seeds of that plant and allowed the forest to become much more diverse than it would be probably without bats. And um, lastly, the reason we're doing bats today is because there's one of my favorite uh, mammals. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see them throughout the world from um, the large bat caves in uh, Texas, uh, where 15 million Mexican free-tailed bats fly out every night from Bracken Caves in Texas. Uh, I've been lucky to see vampire bats in Mexico and seen uh, the wounds that they create on uh, livestock. I've seen flying foxes in Asia, like the ones we're drawing today, uh, and hundreds of thousands of uh, wrinkle-lipped, free-tailed bats uh, in Borneo in Gomantang Caves, which is really um, a, a fantastic event to watch. <laughs> so anyway, I'm fascinated with bats, and I'm trying to, of course, share that fascination with you to have you find some more uh, uh, understanding and empathy for, for bats and not just the fake ones that you see um, in Halloween like I am today. 
So, um, so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about characteristics of bats again, uh, because we want you to understand um, bats. Uh, really in understanding anything you draw, it's best to learn a bit about them first so that you can look at them while you're drawing them and know the things to look for. And so um, bats are, um, it, it, their biggest uh, uh, taxonomic uh, grouping are mammals. They're in the mammal class. And so you can see from this uh, bat here uh, that it has fur like mammals do. And uh, bats are also warm-blooded like mammals, like us. They have a uh, live birth um, instead of having eggs. <laughs> and they nurse their young with mammary glands. Uh, and they also have sweat glands and scent glands. And they have specialized teeth. So their teeth aren't just really plain and, and all the same in their mouth like uh, a reptile or a fish. They have specialized teeth depending on their diet. So some teeth might be long, like kind of like a vampire uh, for, for eating and biting, and um, others might be shorter for, for crushing and chewing. Uh, and so they have also a really similar uh, skeleton to us. Um, and we'll look at that in a bit. But now, um, first, uh, another characteristic um, of bats, um, well, sorry, bats are mammals, and within the mammal grouping, the mammal class, are the bats. And uh, they are actually the second largest group besides rodents. Uh, there's about 1,300 or more species at, the re at this recording of bats in the world, and that's almost a quarter of all mammal species. Uh, and, you know, because they're nocturnal and because many of them are, are tropical, you might not realize um, how many there are. You might just think that there's the one that comes out uh, over the meadow near your house at night and you might see it uh, chasing in some insects. But um, there are uh, over 1,300 species. And so they're in the order Chiroptera, which is only second only um, in, in size to the rodents even though kind of from this picture, you can see that they look a lot like a rodent. If you took away the wings, they would look like a little uh, mouse perhaps. Um, but bats are the only group to uh, fly, and that is their main characteristic that separates them from, from different mammals. Um, now, some mammals are sort of adapted to glide, like uh, um, flying squirrels and flying lemurs. Uh, which I've had the pleasure to see uh, both of in the Asian tropics. Uh, but um, bats are the only order that is um, evolutionarily adapted to have um, their forelimbs uh, adapted into wings. Okay, and so in this photograph, you can clearly see that they do have the, these wings, and the wings are made from, um, from kind of a sandwiching of these membranes on either side of their, um, of their arms, starting at the shoulder all the way out to the five uh, digits. And you can see those digits uh, very clearly here in this photo. And you can also see um, all of the, the blood vessels and the... The, well, you can't see the nerves, but you can definitely see the blood vessels. So the bat's wing um, is richly uh, vascularized and innervated to make it um, uh, really strong and supple and able to um, have them fly. Um, so they're different from birds in that they don't have uh, feathers, obviously, and that they're um, the 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 uh, fingers are longer um, to hold the wings and. Um, where was I going with that? So yeah, so um, they're a little bit different than birds also in that they're a lot more flexible flyers. You've probably again seen bats out at night and you can tell a bat um, compared to a bird or even a moth by the er erratic way that they can fly. And they can do that because they can move each of their uh, wings more independently and in more directions uh, than a bird, giving them a lot more uh, agility and being able to dart after insects very quickly. And uh, in this kind of spooky Halloween-ish uh, picture of the skeleton of a bat, this is actually a flying fox bat that we're gonna um, draw later. 
you can clearly see that their um, skeletons are a lot like you know any other vertebrate and especially a lot like other mammals except for the fact that their their fingers are really elongated and that allows them to have that membrane that um, makes the wing and you can also see their thumb has um, a long is, is long and has a nail which is kind of unique to flying foxes and the second um, index finger also has a nail and the third, fourth, and fifth uh, don't have nails. You can also see uh, their, their ribs and their backbone and their hip bones, uh, but their hips are very small and narrow compared to other mammals, um, so they aren't able to walk. Uh, but you do see their legs are very similar to other mammals and having a, a femur and then the, the lower leg and then five uh, digits on their toes. So they're not able to um, walk on all fours or, um, or stand upright like humans, but they do uh, hang and they uh, roost uh, most of them uh, during the day by hanging uh, from a tree or the rafters or a cave. And so there are two major groups of bats. Um, the one you're most familiar with are called the micro bats. So there's micro or small bats and mega or large bats. So you're probably more familiar with the micro bats if you live in the uh, Northern hemisphere like I do. And these are smaller bats. They have poor vision, they have smaller eyes and they find their way and find their prey through um, echolocation sort of similar to the way uh, baleen whales uh, find their, their food. Um, and, no, wait, is it baleen whales or is it the other toothed whales? No, it's toothed whales, that's right, sorry. How toothed whales find their prey using echolocation. Alrighty, so anyway, they're, um, they're pretty small, the microbats. And uh, they have interesting facial features. Many of them have uh, ears that are different sizes and shapes that are characteristic of the species. And their noses often have uh, really interesting patterns and textures. And sometimes they even have what's called a leaf on their nose. And so in, in this case, here's a picture of Honduran tent bats that I was lucky to see. Uh, in Honduras and Costa Rica, and you can see their little yellow noses that have uh, a little leaf-like shape on them. So lots of microbats have unique um, ears and noses that help to identify them. Now, um, this is a very rare color uh, in bats. There's only like six species of bats that have white fur. Most other bats have black or brown or reddish or gray fur, but this is unique. And um, uh, microbats might also have a tail. It might be long or short and enclosed in a membrane or free, and that's really variable, something to uh, look for. So the other group of bats, um, other than the microbats, are the megabats. And um, there are a lot fewer of those. Remember how I said there's 1,300 species of bats altogether? Well, um, within the megabats, um, there's only one family and they're uh, all called fruit bats. And so they get around um, not by echolocation, but by their large eyes and ears and sense of smell to help them find their food. And um, here, <laughs> here you can see their color patterns and you can see how they can crawl. And uh, they're very uh, large and they often have a very long thumb. You can see that thumb towards the top and it has a claw on it. So they use those to crawl around on the trees, uh, finding the uh, flowers that they pollinate uh, because they eat pollen and nectar and also to find the, the fruit that they eat. And so within the fruit bat family are specifically the flying foxes. And so there's about 160 or more or less species of flying foxes. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. There's about 160 fruit bats. And within that, there's about 60 of them are called flying foxes. And those are found only in Asia, uh, in Africa and Australia. And um, as I said before, they're very important pollinators uh, and fruit uh, dispersers. And they can live up to 20 years. 
and they have, uh, as I said, very strong uh, thumbs with nails on them and very strong legs, and they crawl all throughout the trees to look for ripe um, fruits and uh, flowers with pollen and nectar on them. So they're very important pollinators for things like mango and banana and agave and cashews and seed dispersers for those as well. And here's one eating some fruits. And here's another one uh, using that, that clawed thumb to bring a fruit towards it. So they have, they're really dexterous. And I've been lucky to see hundreds of these guys up in a tree uh, in, um, on some islands off the um, island of Borneo where they were foraging uh, for these uh, fruits. Okay, so um, before we go on to our sketching part, I just wanted to kind of finish up with the bat biology and giving you this link to learn a lot more about bats on my website. I have a whole series of blog posts about spooky nature that I share during Halloween, and I have one about bats. And so you can um, go to this link and find out more about bats. And um, here we see an illustration of a, a micro bat. Uh, this is a Western pipistrelle bat that I illustrated, uh, and it lives in uh, North America. So now we're going to um, start talking about drawing, and I first want to share my philosophy about the artistic process because so many people are um, afraid of art and afraid of drawing and think that they um, left that behind in childhood when perhaps a, uh, a, another student or a parent or a teacher told them they didn't have the talent. So I like to get away from all that, and I like to just think of three core ideas that are part of my philosophy. And the first one is learning to draw while drawing to learn. So uh, we only get better, you know, as we practice. And so we want to more focus as we're drawing on something about what we're learning about the subject. Because as you'll realize when you're drawing the bat, there's things you'll realize about the bat's eyes and ears and wings and legs that you never would have noticed if you hadn't have spent the time to draw it. That is, if you'd only looked at a photograph or a, a video of it. Spending the time to really use all of your brain drawing really helps you to remember um, something and hopefully give you more uh, compassion and understanding and empathy for it. Secondly, I like to think of the process over the product. So again, we're going to be um, having the drawing process as we're thinking about the organism that we're drawing and that we're going to value that more than the final product. And thirdly, progress over for perfection, meaning that you will progress in both your drawing skills and your observation skills. Uh, and that you want to value that over having some uh, perfect drawing. It's not about it's not about the product. I like to focus on um, the process. Alrighty, so that's a little bit about my philosophy about the artistic process. Now, um, before we get started drawing the bat, uh, I want to just uh, quickly go over six things six things um, that um, you may have seen already if you've been in my uh, Stick Figures to Songbirds class in 60 minutes. And if you haven't, you can sign up at the link below uh, on my website. And so these are the six things that um, I always think about when I'm drawing and throughout the drawing process and that I like uh, my students to think about as well. So the first one is blocking in. So when we're going to draw something, I'd like to start with the core part of the animal's body. Like for example, in this bird, you know, his kind of oval or egg shaped uh, core of his body. And we're thinking about those structures in terms of, is it a circle? Is it a square, a rectangle, a triangle? Secondly, I like to think of proportions because once we have one structure and we're going to add on different structures, then we're starting to think of what size or proportion is that second thing to the first. So we're thinking of is the head half as big as the body? Is the tail a third as long as the body? Those kind of things. Thirdly, I like to think of alignment. So that means uh, what structures are aligned with other structures. Like in this case, the, the end of the beak is aligned with the, the front of the chest. So taking sort of plumb lines down vertically and horizontally and at different angles to see what structures line up with each other. 
Next is the idea of flow lines, and that's kind of a right brain way for me to think of uh, drawing and um, look at the lines on my structure as I'm drawing it. And what that means is that I like to think of the, um, I like to imagine or envision perhaps that uh, my organism, like the robin, would be like a boulder in the middle of a stream. And my lines that I'm drawing are the river currents that are going around that. So I like to think of, you know, if I was looking at those lines, are they going over that boulder uh, gently or um, in, a, in an angular way that's gonna make ripples and cascades and noises in the water? So that concept might work for you or it might not, but I like it. Uh, next are angles, and that's uh, where um, you can think of all of the, the angles that you're drawing on the organism uh, in terms of, is it a right I, um, angle, like 90 degrees, is it 45 degrees, 10 degrees? So in this picture, the, um, the bill and the chest are kind of at a 90 degree angle whereas the um, back toe is more at maybe a 30 degree angle. Then lastly, thinking of negative shapes. And um, those are quite easy to see when you have a white background like this, uh, a little bit harder to see in the field, but it's a concept to think about where um, you have negative shapes or spaces, meaning those are the things that aren't your subject, that are around it, that are shapes around it. And it's amazing how thinking of that will kind of switch your brain um, to the right brain and really make you look at something more closely. Okay, so those are six things to think about uh, while you're drawing anything. All right, so now we're gonna start drawing our flying fox. And so if you haven't already, um, download your cheat sheet that says, let's sketch flying foxes. Uh, and have a pencil ready. And here's a link, um, if you don't already have it um, from another source, uh, you can get the uh, cheat sheet downloadable PDF uh, right here. Okay, let's get started sketching our flying fox bat. So we're gonna start really light and loose, but I'm gonna draw a little bit darker than I want you to draw because I want you to be able to see it on the video. But uh, realize that you should be drawing so light that you can barely see the lines in the beginning. And then as you firm up your lines and get closer to finishing, you can go darker and darker and more confident with your lines. But we're gonna start really light. But again, I'm gonna draw darker than I want you to draw. Okay, okay, let's get going. We see if we have this nice box that kind of helps us. We wouldn't have that in real life, of course. So I just kind of mark out where I'm gonna be here. Good. And then I would start with the bat's body, um, kind of like this. And realizing we're always wanting to draw things larger sometimes if we think they're more important. Just gonna flesh out the actual body of the bat. And again, I hope you can see this. I'm already trying to make him look too much like a fox with that big old nose. <laughs> but that's why we stay really light. And we're not doing any erasing. Super, super light. And then we're just gonna kind of box in where his legs and feet are gonna go then where the wings are gonna go, just super light. His right wing here and the, the uh, thumb there. And the front of the wing. So you see I'm not doing any racing, just moving that pencil, looking at a structure and then trying to draw it Kind of pointing helps me keep track of where I'm at. Just lightly flushing him in. Okay, so once I've got a little bit everywhere, I'll go in again and get more firmer um, from the body outward. So again, kind of looking at the body here, we see a lot of nice negative shapes to help us draw these shapes that are white here. 
that cut in all these sort of triangular shapes here, rectangular shapes, really going to help us to see and draw. And these angles, 90 degree angles here, 30 degree, that kind of thing. So let's go back to the body now, flush that out a bit more. Got a shoulder here. And his little ear, I think, was misplaced a bit. I think I got his head a little bit too big there. Again, I'm just not doing any erasing yet. I think that's a male. I don't know, maybe that's his little private parts there. Okay. Not committing to any one line quite yet, but I am going a little darker than I did before. There's a shadow falling on his body here from the wing, but I think the body is a little bit bigger. That's why I'm drawing it a little bit bigger. Okay. And um, the legs with the little foot and the other leg with the foot. Noticing these, this negative shape here. So leaving that. Okay, not gonna get too detailed with the little toes yet. Just gonna flesh out everything here. I think you can see a leg there, barely, that leg. Okay. Okay, I think I will fix that nose. <laughs> Okay, now let's go back. Um, again, working a little bit everywhere, not committing to any one line yet till we get them all down. Okay, so let's look at this uh, right wing, his right wing. <laughs> uh, so again, looking at this, I'd gotten it a little bit too steep before, so that's why we stay really light. And we get this claw here. And that steep angle. For the wing. Okay. Steep angle. And we see some of these little oval areas where the uh, the wing bones are, bones of the hand, that is. Okay, again, I'm just going to stay that light for now till I get this other wing in. And let's see, we've got the front side of the wing and the back side behind his ear sort of okay and it just helps to for me to kind of focus where I'm drawing there we go. And again, these bones here are just really lightly. Let's see, where are they going here? Yeah, there we go. Okay. And those joints, can't really see it, but it's kind of like this. Those, that joint is here. So we don't want to draw what we don't see, so it'll be shadow you can see there. Okay. All right, so now that we have it all fleshed out, uh, we can keep going uh, and firming up the lines and uh, just adding some more details now that we're pretty sure of the general outline. So again, I'll go back to the body and then do the legs and the wings. Um, and we'll have them all pretty much fleshed out. Okay, let's look, work on this cute little bat face. 
flying foxes have these adorable bat faces. And really big eyes because they don't use echolocation. They use their eyes to find their prey, which for most flying foxes is mainly uh, flowers and pollen and fruit. Okay. And then get some fur on him. Okay. Here we go. And then the shoulder here. Okay, you got that. All right. Then let's get over to these legs here. I think I made this leg a little bit too big. <laughs> and so they've got these five toes. We can just two, three, four, <laughs> five toes with some very sharp claws to help them hang on to the branches because they're crawling on the branches to be able to see, find the flowers that they eat the nectar from. There we go. There we go. Okay. Then up to this wing here. Let's see. This thumb has a super big claw. Again, they use those claws to crawl on the trees to get to the flowers. They pollinate while they're getting the nectar and to get to the fruit that they eat. Okay, so I've skipped ahead a little bit to save some time. And you see that I've just uh, firmed up these lines a bit more. And uh, I've started to add some uh, shading here onto the fur. Now, if you wanted, you could just quit right here, or you could add some more uh, shading or different values uh, to make the fox more three-dimensional. And so um, one way you could do that is you could continue with this pencil, or um, it might be a little quicker if you used a different pencil, uh, either a regular pencil that is very dull or uh, more of a shading pencil like this 4B. And uh, then you can uh, smear it with one of these, um, uh, uh, what do they call these, tortillions <laughs> or uh, smudging tools. Anyway, so I'll give you sort of an idea here. So you can see there's a variety of values. The um, fox is the lightest part, especially his shoulder here. And then he gets a little darker underneath to show the cast shadow. Uh, and then the darkest areas um, are under the wing in the shadow of the wing here and here uh, and back here. So uh, we could just start there to really get us somewhere quickly. And so I'm just going to start adding some shadow and I can just kind of do it with the, well, with this, doesn't have to be the side of the pencil if you have a nice dull pencil. And this goes pretty quick. And of course you could spend as much time as you wanted on something like this. But to really bring this forward, this wing forward, you want to get some nice shadowing to bring the back, the underside of the wing back. There we go. And then you can see if you wanted to, you could smudge it with this. And this works even better on uh, real drawing paper. This is just kind of a cardstock. So there's that kind of idea, right? And so we could keep going with that if we wanted to. This can even be uh, a drawing tool too. Once you get some graphite on it, uh, like it can go under here and give us a little bit of a softer edge. You can see that kind of a thing. Okay, so anyway, we can add some more darks. His 
His ear is really black. And uh, let's see, his muzzle is kind of black. So we'd shade those first with a pencil and then darken them up. Um, what else? You know, under here, under here is pretty dark and that would, shading that would help to uh, bring this forward. And I'm just kind of going fast here, but you could spend more time I'm trying to give you the idea. And again, you know, you uh, just kind of blend it with this. There we go. And uh, again, you can use this to shade with. It's kind of fun. All right. There we go. Same thing under here. This wing under here is very dark compared to his forehead. So we can bring the forehead forward by really shadowing this wing. And yeah, really shadowing under here. Now, blending it a bit. Yeah, I want to really emphasize his head. And actually, the underside of his head is darker than the wing there. So it kind of separate, kind of gets exact opposite, doesn't it? Yeah, like that. And add a little bit of darkness here for those bones of the fingers. Yeah, a little bit more here. A little bit more here. Let me get this a little bit more. And back to something sharper. And emphasize the strength of those toes. Okay. Okay, well, I think that should get you started. Okay, hope you enjoyed this little tutorial on flying fox bats. Bye now.